Good morning, students, or maybe it's even afternoon. I guess it, well, almost. Um, this is going to be my last video for the semester. Uh, as you know, this is the last week. Uh, we will be drawing conclusions uh, to the course, and the finals begin next week. So what I will do in this video is to talk to you a little bit about drawing conclusions, I suppose, to the course. And then I'll give you a little bit more insight into Twelfth Night. And then, for all purposes, we end the um, semester. I guess needless to say, this has not been the semester that you would have chosen, nor the semester that I would have uh, chosen. But I would like to think that maybe both of us, you as students, uh, for me as a professor, I think that we've done the best that we can or could have under these uh, rather difficult circumstances. You all need to understand that this is not the preferred way that I uh, would have chosen to teach the course. Um, and all of this was new to me. And actually, I've tried to do the best that I, I knew how to do. And I did have help, and if I would not have had some of this help, none of this would have come off as well as I think that it did. So I simply ask you to be understanding, and I would almost say at the same time, maybe a little bit uh, forgiving. I think in your Shakespeare class, uh, maybe unlike my other class, most of you have tried to cooperate and you've gotten your work in on time. Now, there are always exceptions, and I want to remind you very clearly that even though some in the university community really may have chosen to take the side entirely of students, and, you know, there are these veiled promises that everything's going to be uh, all right and that sort of thing, but Come on, realistically, I think what maybe some are failing to take into account is that certainly it's been very, very, very difficult of you. And I think throughout my videos, uh, I have offered you as much, shown you compassion and offered you as much consolation as anyone could. What bothers me a little bit, though, it's a little one-sided uh, on the part of some in the university. Uh, I think some have failed to take into account that <laughs> these times have been very, very trying on us, too, as professors. We certainly haven't been immune from uh, this horrible plague that has befallen and all of the uncertainties and difficulties that have accompanied this time. So, um, I think that we need to show a kind of sensitivity, uh, frankly, to you, but to us as well. So with that in mind, so I don't just uh, harp on something that you obviously know, I want to explain to you a little bit in terms of finishing the course, my expectations. Uh, I'm going to grade you as fairly as I can, but you know, if you don't turn in the work, then I, I would think your expectations can't be realized. I did ask you to do uh, your last daily assignments consisted of uh, a series of uh, questions, one on Shakespeare and then one on the play. That's all been recorded. And if you haven't turned those in, uh, well, it's a little bit late now. So I would simply tell you to concentrate on the final. All of you seem to have done well on the major exam on the Merchant of Venice. So what you want to do now is to make preparation for the final. Now I'm having to go by the scheduled time for your final exam. And you know we finished the course, if we were in a face-to-face -face situation, we would finish the course this Friday. And then the finals begin next week. Um, your final 
actually will be on Wednesday. And if I count this, uh, Monday is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So uh, I want you to consider your final to be uh, Wednesday. Then I believe it would be May the uh, sixth. But uh, and they had this specified time, which you know we pay no attention to. So what I'm going to do is. I'm going to explain to you the nature of the final. And I, if I were you, I would go ahead and, and start working on the final now. I mean, if you want to get it over with, turn it in to me. I will give you a deadline. Uh, I need to have it Wednesday afternoon of next week, next week by five o'clock. Now I can't, because the registrar's uh, or the registrar's office puts a time uh, table on us to get grades in. And if these grades aren't turned in, then uh, they throw them out and we have to go over to their office and record these grades by hand. Well, with everything that's going on, some of you won't be getting a grade. So respect uh, my deadline. I'm giving you Wednesday. Uh, that's going to be, you're going to have the benefit of almost a week and a half, and the assignment is not going to be that difficult. So I'm thinking I have the correct date. Once again, I say uh, Friday's the first, Saturday the, uh, the second, Sunday the third, Monday's the fourth, Tuesday the fifth, so it should be uh, Wednesday, um, May 6th, 5 o'clock. Now, I had asked you to look at a video uh, of as you, I mean, of uh, Twelfth Night. And what I want to do there, I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit more leniency. I would like a reaction to that video of about a page, but I'm going to make this as a kind of bonus question. Some of you have missed reading quizzes, and there, there may be a zero or two out there. I will substitute the uh, reaction to the video, your reaction paper, uh, which might be nothing more than a kind of uh, uh, summary, a kind of, uh, shall I say, uh, a reaction to your having watched the video, or even a portion of the video. So if you're interested, write a page reaction to the video that you watched. Uh, I would think about a page, page and a half is sufficient. Now, if you feel that your grades are adequate, which you certainly should know by now, uh, you do not have to do this. I'm going to make it optional. But if you want to add uh, more credits to your average, then I would suggest you do so. But once again, the choice is yours. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But all of you who want to receive credit for the course need to do <clears throat> these two questions that I'm going to call your attention to. And when I say two questions, I'm going to give you two questions and you choose one. And I would like this to be a very detailed, this is going to be a major grade uh, as your final. You don't have to go back and review any past information. I'm, I'm giving you a kind of broad question reacting, if you will, to the plays that we've read this semester. Now, if for some reason some circumstances have occurred and you simply need to drop the course, remember that they've extended the drop date to this Friday, May 1st. Please go in and drop the course if you have to, if you need to, by Friday. Uh, otherwise, um, It'll be recorded as an F. And if you don't turn in this paper next week, then uh, you're going to, you know, uh, suffer, if you will, the consequences. So I don't mean to sound particularly stern, but I'm trying to be very exacting and a little bit realistic with you. So let's then, as I said, by the time we finish this video today, this will be my last and you have more than ample time to do this work. 
So let me begin by this, and I'm giving you the two questions that I want you to consider for the final. The length here, I would think anywhere between three to four pages. That's sufficient. Give as much details, go to the text, and use quotes. So what I want to do is ex uh, ex give you the question and then offer you a kind of explanation. So I'm going to sort of, I guess what I'm saying is to talk you through it. So one question that you consider is this. Uh, I want you to talk about the three women in the plays that we've looked at this semester. Uh, uh, obviously, we'd, you would want to reference Rosalind uh, in uh, As You Like It, Portia in The Merchant of Venice, and Viola in uh, Twelfth Night. And I want you to talk about Shakespeare's treatment of women in these plays. Delineate their character. Uh, talk about uh, what they do in terms of the play. Why would we want to say, for example, that they are such uh, uh, decisive, insightful characters? Uh, how do they blend certain plot situations, that sort of thing? So, in essence, what you're going to do is to write a portrayal of Shakespeare's three female characters in uh, these respective plays. Now, when possible, and if you want to simply add a little bit of uh, depth to your question, uh, you can include uh, the importance uh, of, for example, Touchstone and Festy as um, fools and how they, in a sense, may hinder or support, say, Rosalind or Viola. Now, we don't have one such character in The Merchant of Venice, so I would not have an expectation uh, uh, there. So please uh, put, this is a, could be a very insightful, a very thoughtful question for you. So put a little bit of time into it. I mean, here it's Tuesday. You should receive this video in the course of the afternoon, and you can start it now, as I said. Uh, when you finish it, you don't have to wait until next week. Go ahead and turn it in, and you'll have this out of the way. So this is the last bit of written work. I do want it once again in a formal Word document, as you did with the Merchant of Venice. Now, the other question, if you say, okay, maybe I don't want to do this question, uh, is there another choice? There is, and I repeat to you again, you don't have to do both questions. Choose one of the two. Now, the second question is, I want you to, and I've not, made some notes for myself. I've written from a study of the plays read this semester, and I mean the three plays. I want you to arrive at what constitutes a a perception of Shakespeare's uh, notion of comedy. Remember I told you that the, the plays that I've taught this semester, each one contributes to what he wanted to achieve and uh, what constitutes to him perfect comedy. And all I would call your attention to here, outside of your having read the plays, and you heard our, my lectures before the break, and then you uh, had the lecture on The Merchant of Venice, and I've given you some insights, and we'll continue in a moment on Twelfth Night. Remember when I had begun the course, before we actually did get into our discussion of As You Like It, I took uh, several class periods and explained to you what would constitute Shakespeare's uh, theory, perception of comedy. Remember one of the things I mentioned about the phases of comedy? I talked to you about the movement theme, talked to you about uh, different types of characters, that sort of thing. So go back over your notes since you have the opportunity to do this work outside of a formal class structure and pick out points that you would like to in other words, if somebody says to you, 
All right, you read these comedies. What would you think, uh, what qualifies Shakespeare as a master of, uh, of writing comedy? And this is what you're going to do. So I'm hoping for uh, my explanations here are clear to you. So what you're going to do is talk about Shakespeare's theory of comedy. And I would like for you to reference, if you will, the three plays. So I repeat just a little bit for you. Uh, one question, Shakespeare's treatment of women in terms of the three plays, working into, as you see fit, the importance of Touchstone and the importance of Festi uh, as fools uh, in those uh, two plays. And then the other is this perception of comedy. So I think that this should qualify as a kind of clear explanation I'll reference it to you uh, in uh, my email or uh, to you that will come after the video. But really, I don't have to write out a, a formal question. If you're watching the video, I'm offering you an explanation. And if you ask, will you allow any kind of flexibility? Of course, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this, and I'm attempting to explain it to you. So please, all I ask is you get it into me. Don't come up uh, past the final uh, exam time uh, next week and say, well, I'll, because I may have to have turned in these grades. So once, as I said at the beginning of my comments to you uh, this uh, hour, I want you to, you've got to respect my deadline now. Don't come up and say, well, such and such happened. You have a week or better to prepare. So with that done, I would like to call your attention as we close for today. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, Twelfth Night. I want to suggest some themes, and some of these themes might be useful if you're going to talk about um, twelve, uh, certainly Twelfth Night, and you might find this useful as you're going to present a kind of delineation of Iola. Now, also, some of this might be very useful if you're going to do that second question on Shakespeare's uh, theory of comedy. Now, one point I would make here is that, and this is something that you could bring out in that second question, this play differs from uh, his other comedies. One thing, note, here's a good point of comparison. If you were going to compare Twelfth Night to, say, uh, the Merchant of Venice. You don't have any antagonisms in this play. Uh, you don't have any actual disunion. Uh, this play, to me, has a kind of beginning sense of what I call static self-containment. Uh, there's not going to be, for example, the comic movement uh, from disorder to harmony. That's that's different. But it, instead, it's going to be the transformation of isolation into what I like to explain as mutual uh, cohesion. In other words, it's the, here's a good theme, it's a, a principle of reciprocity. It's the principle of mutual exchange. That's apparent in the play. All right, here's an example. Festi. You remember after he's told that his absence threatens his security uh, as Olivia's fool, look what he does. He successfully talks her out of her humor, and in return, he's going to gain her support. Um, another instance. What about Toby's relationship with Andrew? It demonstrates this principle uh, by negative example. All Toby is wanting to do is to coax money out of Andrew with nothing in assurance but deceptive means. So I hope this has offered you a kind of uh, explanation here. Um, see, what it all amounts to, it does tie in with the structure a bit, and it seems to, to me to show that these characters have a kind of willingness to have commerce with what I call human society. Now note, 
But here's a good point of comparison. If you were to go to as you like it, remember I said that one significant character who did not have an opportunity to leave the forest, as many of the others did, he had to stay behind. Remember the melancholy Jaques? Well, the only character who does not have this commerce with human society is Melvolio. Remember, he's really learned nothing at the end of the play. You remember what he says very smugly? I am not of your element. See? So I think that's an important consideration, and you can gain a bit of mileage uh, here. Now, the last thing I call your attention to, I want to review with you somewhat hurriedly some apparent themes that I see in the play and call your attention to. Um, one theme, very obviously to me, or in an obvious way to me, is this theme of self-deception. Uh, note how many characters in the play cling to false ideas about themselves. Uh, much of the humor in the play derives from this fact. All right, look, Sir Andrew thinks that he's this country gentleman. Actually, he's nothing more than a kind of clumsy simpleton, and particularly when he tries to live up to his self-image, he behaves so very, very foolishly. Now, look at Melvelia. Talk about self-deception. He thinks that he, for all purposes, is superior to other characters. Uh, uh, Orsino thinks in, uh, that he's in love with uh, Olivia when in fact initially he simply is I point, as I pointed out in other plays he simply is in love with love alright now even when these characters are deceived by others they're still if you will victims of their own self-deception. All right, the letter that Maria uh, uses with Malvolio uh, reinforces this fact. Now, another theme again, as I've told you since day one of the course, is the theme of appearance and reality. Uh, <laughs> you know from real life, all of you have experienced it, I certainly have, that uh, we, we know appearances are often deceiving. Uh, <laughs> deception is everywhere. Now look, how about here is an illustration. You have appearance, this severe Puritan, all right, on the surface, but in reality, he's not. Look at the hypocrisy that accompanies uh, appearance and reality, he's nothing more than a vain social climber. All right, the letter that promises uh, fortune simply is assuming your own self-destruction. Uh, so I think excellent in terms of uh, self-deception. If you want to look at Viola's clothing, her disguise, but Look, she still remains very honest and very virtuous. Now, my point to you here is, and here's something that would work in your two uh, discussion questions. Viola and uh, Rosalind have something in common. Both of them are very much atoned characters. You remember when we talked about the theme of atonement and as you like it? Um, how about the theme of vanity? Vanity as a theme, self-love. All right, you know for all purposes that uh, this idea of vanity, if people have too much of an uh, inflated ego of their self-worth, they behave foolishly. Malvolio, he loves nobody but himself. Some misread and say, oh my gosh, He's really very uh, interested in Olivia. Uh, he loves her. No. He wants to marry her simply because he thinks by marrying Olivia 
that that's going to help raise his social status. All right, now, he is so vain that he never questions the letter that uh, he gets from Maria. So don't you see very much the importance here of uh, self-love, vanity, that sort of thing. Now, uh, another thing I called your attention to, which you uh, readily answered in the question on your last assignment was the idea of sibling love. Viola and Sebastian, look at the deep sadness when each thinks that the other was drowned. All right, I think that this feeling on the part of both uh, very much is evident of their love for each other. All right, contrast that feeling of love to what we've just talked about, if you will, the self-love of Malvolio. Another good theme in the play is the importance of laughter. Now, this is something that at the end of the play, and this is why he's alone, Malvolio clarifies this theme by refusing to see, appreciate, understand the humor in the jokes played upon him. Look, like Shylock, in order to rejoin back and be a part of this functioning society, invoke a little bit of laughter, because laughter has very much a kind of healing effect. All right, he's beset more by this idea of revenge. See, uh, this is one of the reasons why he's not that much of a desirable character. Now, uh, a kind of love in the play that I can call your attention to is pay attention to the idea of courtly love in the play. This is one of the things that Olivia is going to help the Duke, in a sense, to understand. All right? Now, she's going to, in other words, all the Duke initially, or Asino does, initially is to enjoy the pains of unrequited love. See, he is very much, as I've said, in love with being in love. All right, now, he is trying to love a woman initially that he cannot possibly love. So very much his pining, the way that he uh, listens to music and so forth. This is just simply out of, of the catalog of what would constitute courtly love. Now, another kind of uh, theme in the play, love, again, is mature love, represented, of course, by Viola. Now, she's very unselfish, and look how she is willing to put her own feelings, uh, I mean, I, I strike that, how uh, in such a, she's not selfish at all, she's going to put Orsino's feelings before her own. Now, her feelings don't result from a feeling of fancy. They re her feelings are very real. Her feelings are very genuine. And then another theme, and I think for all purposes, this could be a good uh, concluding theme in terms of the play. Uh, once again, you have the love of friend. Uh, I call your attention to the feelings between Sebastian and Antonio. You see, I guess I'm getting a kind of warning. My clocks are going off, and probably it's a good sign for me to draw a kind of conclusion. What the two here share, they share this feeling of trust and concern. Each is interested in the other person's well-being, though difficult situations might initially prevent this from happening. So this is my conclusion then. Of course, if I had had more time, and probably if you had had more time, I would have done a, a closer textual analysis of the play. But as often is the case, time hasn't been on our side. 
And certainly this is something that um, we've all experienced. So what I want you to do now, uh, you have all of the information that you possibly need in, in terms of Twelfth Night, and I want you to use it as you see fit. All I ask you to do then is if you will respect what I ask you in terms of submitting this last paper, this will constitute your final exam. So um, I'll make note of this in my email uh, to you. So uh, I draw a conclusion again, as I've said, I wish you well, and I hope that um, likely it's not gonna happen in the summer, but maybe by fall, we can be back on campus and have a face-to-face, -face, uh, like we should, uh, class setting. So good luck to all of you, and we'll talk later.